So this story is really quick today. Ever since I can remember, there has been a debate going on about me. Mm -hmm. My whole life, there has been a debate going on about my face. Y'all say, what in the world? (laughs) All the time I hear, you are your father's twin. Or, on the other side of it, I hear, I cannot believe how much you look like your mom. Now, anytime I'm around people that know my parents, excuse me, I hear it from at least one person. Now, don't misunderstand me. I find it to be one of the highest compliments to hear that. I remind somebody of either my dad or my mom. They are both beautiful people on the inside and on the outside. Whether, exactly. So whether it be in personality or whether it be in looks, it is a compliment that I always treasure. But out of curiosity today, we are going to have this debate. If you are team dad and you think that dad and I look alike, I want you to raise your hand. (laughs) What? (laughs) Now, (laughs) what? That is crazy because, because I have always heard, even mom said, that dad and I look so much alike, that we are twins. That is wild. Even Drew says that mom and I do not look anything alike. Well, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't need to ask y'all to raise your hands for the mom part, because every one of you would. That is insane. Oh, y'all just never cease to amaze me. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, let me present some new evidence to the court. I may favor both, but my real twin is somebody else. Mm. My real twin is my granny and ducky, my granny duck, and here is the evidence. Tom, could you show them? Now. Now. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Now, can you see the resemblance there? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yep. So, now we're going to talk about the spiritual. I told y'all that was going to be a really quick one. We have accepted Jesus into our hearts. He wrote our name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and he made us a new creation. God, our Father, has adopted us into his family. We are his, and he is ours. But how often do we resemble our Father? Do our words and our actions match the family name that we proclaim? It's easy to say you're a Christian, But does your everyday life line up to what you claim? It's easy to show up singing, oh, how I love Jesus. But is what you are in here the same as what you are out there? Are you shining for Christ? Or are you living in sin like the world? You might talk a big game on Facebook, but is your talk on there matching what people see in person? You can read the Bible through in a week, but are you following the commands and the words found in it? You can say you talk to God regularly, But are the words you pray lining up with the words that you speak? If you're comfortable with saying you're following Jesus, but then you're you're chewing out your waitress, you're acting hateful, you're being negative, and you're being mean, then what's your testimony saying? What you say and the way that you live should match up. Remember that you become what you worship. Worshiping God will lead to God's ways. Worship material things, you'll end up empty just like them. Evaluate your priorities. And here's one that you might not like. (laughs) If you're posting on social media about your faith, that's great. But if the next picture is you bragging about your bottle of alcohol, showing off your booze at the restaurant, or how you've laid out a church that day just to have a lazy day, or maybe your post is riddled with sinful behavior, if it's a Sunday and you are laying out, laying on a sofa, or going anywhere you want the rest of the week, but you cannot come to church. And if people see you out and about, but you won't come to church, I'm going to tell you what they see. I know because we see it. They see that church has no priority in your life. They see a hypocrite. They, can see, they see that you can go wherever you want, but you don't have time for the Lord's house. If church has no priority in your life, then neither does the commandments, commands of God. The world is a don't tell me, show me kind of world. So then ask yourself, what is your testimony telling them? Does the watching world look at you and say, why do I need to be saved? 
Why do I need to put in the work to be a Christian? They're living just like I am. Our mission as Christians is to bring them in and not repel them. Watch the company you keep. Being in the company of sin will pull you in, and it will drag you down before you realize it. 2 Corinthians six fourteen through 17 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with believers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that, hath, he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Engaging with the wrong crowd will cause you to lose direction before you know it. Watch who you walk with. Your company can affect the three F's, focus, falling, and failure. Your company can cause you to lose focus, can cause you to fall into the snares of Satan, and can cause you to fail fast. Now, I know that there is nobody perfect. We are human. But instead of bragging about the fact and using it as a crutch and excuse to sin, we should grieve when we mess up. It shouldn't be something we brag about on social media or in conversation. Laziness and sin should not be a picture and a post on Facebook with a hashtag and a pound sign that we boast about. If you are right with him, missing church should grieve you. If you're right with him, being in worship should be the highlight of your week. If you're right with him, the word and the prayer, word and prayer will excite you. Amen. Instead of running to the world, start running to the word. You are being heard even when you are not speaking. You are under a microscope. Saved and unsaved people are watching you to see if you live what you profess. Don't bring shame to his name. Bring glory to the great shepherd. And Christians, if we are claiming the blood of Jesus over our souls and our lives, we should never rejoice in our sin. We should seek how we can turn from it. We are called to a higher standard. We are called to greatness. Amen. We are not called to be enthusiastic about sin. When people see us, they should see him. When people look at us, they should see the family resemblance. When people look at us, they should see the change that Christ can give. It's hard to show his light when we're running with darkness, isn't it? It's hard to show his light when we're acting and talking exactly like the world, the devil, and the sin that the Savior saved us from. It's hard to radiate Christ when our testimony isn't showing it. Things are bleak out in the world today. There's illness, tension, evilness, and wickedness. But because of Christ, we can be a witness of his wonderfulness to the wickedness of the world that surrounds us. Because of Christ, your testimony can draw people to the joy that's found in him. Your words and your actions can draw people to the deliverance of the deliverer. You can serve as a mirror to reflect the redemption found in the Redeemer. When you interact with people, you can reveal the rejoicing that is found in him. Yeah. Serving Christ isn't having time to serve. It's about making the choice to make the time to serve. I can guarantee you that when you serve him, he will bless you more than you could ever imagine. You have a choice. You can be sour to all you meet, or you can show the sweetness of serving the Savior. True blessings are found in following the Father. His ways are good, kind, peaceful, and loving. Reflect that in your day-to-day, -day, daily life. Use your life, your words, your actions to proclaim the power of God. Use your testimony to announce the awesomeness of the Almighty. Use your spoken and written words to broadcast the amazing author of eternal salvation. Instead of boasting in bad behavior, proudly show off the salvation of the Savior. Proudly live a life that is a reflection of the Redeemer. Yes. Flaunt your faith in the Father. Be a reflection of the radiance of God's glory. Be a resemblance of Him. And now I'll give you a little sweetness. <laughs> Sometimes I know the image that we have of ourselves isn't the greatest. Sometimes we look in the mirror and we see what we would like to change, or we look in the mirror and we might see a failure. Or maybe we look in the mirror and we see a lot of pain. We look in the mirror and we wonder how anybody could ever love us. Please remember 
that the way you see yourself, your image of you is distorted. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It's what he sees that matters. He's the one holding you and beholding you. God has never made an accident. He has never made a mistake. He wouldn't start with you. The way you see yourself doesn't measure up to the way that God sees you and loves you. He delights in you. You're important. You're loved enough to him that the creator of the universe sent his only son to suffer and die for you. That speak vo speaks volumes about the measure of the love that he has for you. The mirror might lie to you, and it will lie to you, but the truth of God's love for you is never ending. God only creates beauty. Don't ever judge the creator's creation. You are the Lord of heaven's masterpiece. Who, you are, who are you to judge his handiwork? Remember that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are beautiful because you have been created in his image. Your mind will believe what you feed it. Feed it hope, feed it truth, feed it love, and feed it faith. This week, I encourage you to be more self-aware about your image, not your outside image, but the image that you're showing the outside world. Remember that talking to people about Jesus is one thing, but being a reflection of him is what it's all about. Don't just talk about him, be like him. Watch the company you keep because you will be a reflection of them. The company you keep matters. Surround yourself with like-minded Christians that will lift you up in prayer and lift you up in edification. This family will do just that. This family seeks to serve, to worship, love, and reflect the Savior. So be a part of the good things happening at GBC. Your family loves you so much and rejoices to be able to reflect and resemble the Redeemer right beside you. Thank you for being here today. Please know we're praying for you, and we love you so, so much. Please welcome your pastor. A deadly, serious adventure. As you well know, we've been on the book of Mark for some time last year and into this new year. And today we actually conclude. It's taken several weeks to get through Mark 9. Today we should conclude that. But it's very interesting how the Lord, Word of God concludes with these verses in Mark chapter 9. As I begin the message tonight, uh, this morning, I'm asking you to please refrain from uh, leaving the sanctuary. Please stay in here for the message and for the invitation. It's crucially important you could have an effect on someone else's salvation or their lives being touched by God. This message may be maybe not the message that you were expecting when you came to church today. It may even make you uncomfortable. And, you know, I'm not here to step on your toes because I can jump up and down on your toes even with prosthetic legs. I feel nothing, but you feel a whole lot. But that pain eventually will go away. I'm praying the Spirit of God will get in your heart and create unrest and create a disturbance that you will seek what he has for you. And realizing this, we need God to speak to us through the liberating truth of his word. For it will compel you to live your life for Jesus Christ. We profess to be Christians. Well, to be Christians, to be a Christian is to be in the likeness of Christ. So how we live our lives, it's not hard to live like Jesus in here. But when you go out into the world and the days ahead, even today, tomorrow, and this week, and the days ahead, sometimes you think, well, it's hard to live for Christ. Really, it's not. It's your determination. It's your focus. It's your motivation. And you can live for Christ if you decide to live for Christ. I believe today that sin, and I want you to know that that hell is not worth the sin of this world. And there are a lot of people today living sinful and living apart from God's word, his calling, his desires for their life. Do you desire sin today more than you desire a savior to work in your life? Jesus is better than life and eternity. If you've got him, you have everything needful and necessary. Preaching on these subjects, really, it's, it's not heard in cultural Christianity, churches of today. Many churches, Dave, I'm not being judgmental, I'm just being honest. 
There's a wave going on in America and across that world today called cultural Christianity. This church is not a cultural Christianity church. Nor is this church politically correct. We believe that the word of God is our governing power, not only in this church, but in our lives. I'm convinced that we need hard, I mean hard, doctrinally sound, fiery, spirit-filled, Holy Ghost preaching in our churches and in our pulpits today. And when that happens, we will see that sin will be singed in our lives. We'll see that hearts will be cleansed. We will see the captives set free from the vices of this world. And it will place us in a position where we are right with God. If you had to stand before his throne today, could you declare to him that you are right with God in your life? Could you profess that you live for his kingdom? Could he look at you and say, yes, you did run well. But then would he say to you, you could have run well, but what hindered you? What are the besetting sins that draw us away from the power of holy living? What are the things that are gripping people today to keep them from serving God? There are a lot of vices out there in the world, aren't there? There are a lot of things going on in the lives, just not only of the lost, but they're going on in the lives of the saved. Our lives are a reflection of who Christ is in our life. How we live for him then becomes the priority of our life, shouldn't it? Who we live for is reflected in our daily life. When you get on Facebook, you talk about how much you drank last night or how much you sniffed, snorted, shot up or whatever the case may be. When you get on Facebook and use language that is not acceptable within the vocabulary of a Christian, that is not living for Christ. Preacher, you're splitting hairs. No, I'm telling you today, it's time we start being the people that we are. And if you're going to name the name of Jesus, you need to start living that way. Don't tell people that you belong to Gethsemane Baptist Church and you get on Facebook and use unbecoming language. You put unbecoming things that is not reflecting Jesus Christ. Please don't tell them I'm your pastor. Stand for Christ. We are in a critical year. We are right now in the month of January, the 22nd, the 21st day rather. And we are approaching some very treacherous waters in this year. We're going to see what your Christianity is really made of. Are you going to be caught in the political vacuum that is soaking people up today? And your conversation cannot be about anything but politics, Donald Trump, Joe Biden and everything else that's going on politically. We're not here about politics. Our life is not here about who's in the White House. Our life is here about who is on the throne of heaven and how we live for him. And how that his name is raised up and declared in our lives. Amen. It's time we, the born again body of Christ, start living holy, acceptable glorifying lives to almighty God. Amen. Jesus talks about sin in today's passage. The greatest struggle that we deal with in life, it's not our health concerns. We talk about them, but and they are important. And I'm not minimizing them. We talk about our financial issues in life and how that we overcome with all the issues that we face. We talk about the trials that we're in, have been in, or going through. We talk about the tragedies that we have faced or that we're facing. And we talk about, as I mentioned, the political arena of insanity that's going on in our nation. The greatest struggle are not those things that I just listed, nor any other. 
The greatest struggle that we have today that we deal with in our society and even in our churches and even in our lives is sin. We today have tried to rename it and call it different things. We've tried to powder puff it. We don't want to hear the preacher preach on sin. We don't want to hear the preacher say anything about hell. We don't want to hear the preacher saying anything about you've got to get your life straight. One day you're going to stand before the righteous judge and what is he going to say, what is he going to, say to you? God, listen, God told Cain this in Genesis 4 and 7. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? Do you understand that? He said if you're living for Christ, if you're saved, you're born again, you are accepted. And... If thou dost not well, doest well, sin lieth at the door. Sin lies at the door of not only sinners, those who are lost. For whether you believe it or not, you're still a sinner, even if you're saved. You have been secured by the blood of Jesus and your name has been written in heaven through the process of transformation called salvation. That you saw yourself as a sinner, you asked Christ into your heart and your life and you got born again. I'm not ashamed. I'm a born again child of God. But also I realize if I don't guard my life, I can fall into the traps, the snares of sin that's in this world. In a culture today that is highly subjective and relative in morals, do we really think God, do we really think today God is accepting our behavior? It's easy to say, yeah, that bunch in the world, that, that bunch of this, these people, this, those, these people that, no, how about us individually? Where are we with God? Where are we in our walk? Can God count on us? If you ever played sports and you played a certain position, you become a key player. But you know what? It's just not that one person. It takes the whole team to make it work, doesn't it? We've got to work together in the kingdom of God and not be a stumbling block. We've got to take up the cross, as the Word of God tells us, and follow Christ. We've got to be serious about who we say that we are. Just not wearing the label or a cross tied around your neck. It's how you live your life that shows how real He is in your life. Do we really think that God is accepting our behavior because we just show up at church? See, church is not about just showing up. And I don't understand why people can't get that in their lives to at least show up. Well, preacher, I don't feel good. Yeah, but you'll pop out of that bed like a jack out of the box tomorrow to hit that work scene because you want that money. I'll tell you something more important than money, and that's your relationship with God and knowing Him and walking with Him. It's amazing how people get the miracle cure on Monday. I'm telling you. You've got to understand God's standard is not subjective nor relative. What God says is if you refuse to do that which is right, he says then you better watch out because sin is at your door. And the bad thing is Christians are living in sin and proud of it. How can we proclaim that we're children of God and live that way? We all fall short. I'm the first one in line. But I tell you what, I'm pushing Carlton as hard as I can that he lives to the glory of God and to magnify his name. Therefore today, are you exposing yourself to the control of sin? Because if you open the door, let me tell you what, it will come in quicker than you can snap your finger. But that control can be broken.
by submitting. Hear that word. Because it's a word that's not really accepted today seemingly in churches and Christians' life. If we will submit ourselves to God in his leadership, that we will crown him king and first in our life. It's just not saying it. It's putting it, it's putting it on the ground and running with it. It's declaring that. It's being who you say you are. It's being real in your Christianity. That control can be broken. Now let's go to the word. Mark 9, 42 through 50. Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him. You would think he's talking about children here. Actually, it's not. For he says, for him, that is a millstone that hang, hang around his neck and he shall be cast into the sea. And if the hand offend thee, cut it off, and it's better for thee to enter into life. If you're wondering, so did you do something that you had to chop your legs off? Because you, no. We're not talking about going out and chopping limbs off. But he says, for, for thee to enter into life main, than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not. And the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall not be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. We just heard those words, didn't we? And if thine eye offend thee, your hand your feet, your eye. He said, pluck it out. Better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into where? Hell fire. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Three times he said that. Do you think he's trying to make an impression here? Certainly. For every one for every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salt with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt hath lost its saltiness, I believe we heard this from the Sermon on the Mount too, didn't we? Wherewith shall ye season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. You know, we live on the East Coast and we've heard the threats of hurricanes. The warnings go out. The residents begin preparing for the storms. You've seen that on the news media. They're boarding up windows and they're tying down things and they're securing things in, in and around their home of their lives. You take a Category 4, a Category 5, a hurricane is nothing to be trifled with. I would not try to ride out a storm, but there are those who ignore the warnings and they decide to take their chances. Of those who ride out the storm, more have been lost statistically than that have survived it, survived the storm. These people were not sufficiently afraid of the dangers. There are dangers in life. More greater than a hurricane, tornado, tsunami, or any other natural disaster. The scripture we just read is a storm warning. I today am giving you, whether you're sitting in this church, watching by Facebook, or by television, I'm giving you today a scriptural warning from God's word. So this passage, it can become convincing, it can even become convicting, and it can become disturbing. A deadly, serious Jesus gives us serious or deadly serious warnings. That's what he is doing. And I thank God that he loves us enough that he gives us these warnings about our lives. He gives us a warning about the sin that would beset us and cause us to reject Christ and deliver us into the bowels of hell. 
He tells us that there's a way out of that. He tells us of a Christ who died on a cross, who shed his blood, who paid the price, and all that will come to him, he will in no wise cast out. We're told of a way, for Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If we will come to him, we can receive salvation from that warning. For to reject Jesus, to reject his love, is to guarantee your place in hell. I've heard people say, I don't understand. Had God a loving God, for God so loved the world, could send a soul to hell. Go, God does not send no one to hell. You send yourself there by rejecting him. Amen. Jesus was a hellfire preacher. John the Baptist was a hellfire preacher. And by God's grace, I'm a hellfire preacher. I'm not backing up. I'm standing with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I'm holding up the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And I stand and I know if God did be for me, who could be against me? Amen. You need that in your life. You need to heed the warning today. You can't dabble in sin. You can't drink one beer or one bottle or one shot or one whatever and think you can control it. Nobody will control you. It'll ruin your life. It'll ruin your family. You can't play with drugs. Because let me tell you what all it takes is one enticement and then the next and the next and you're hooked. You can't dabble in pornography and think you can sit in your room on your phone and watch garbage straight from the very bowels of hell and think it won't affect you or anyone else. Oh, it will. It'll put lust in your heart. It'll put lust in your mind and it will destroy your life. You can't dabble in sin. You can't talk about somebody else and not have an effect on their life. See, we talk about the major sins, but how about those little foxes that destroy the vine? How about those little things that nibble and, and just snarl at us and draw us in and we find that we then become a part of it? What is the best thing you can do for people? The only way you can really talk to about people effectively is to talk to God about people and for him to touch them and to bless them and to heal them and to lift them up. I believe God wants to do a mighty healing in hearts and lives. I know we're looking today. We've had many folks that have gone through COVID, sickness, cancers, heart problems, you name it, everything and anything. And I pray for them. And I pray for that healing power that it only can come from the heavens today. But I'm also praying for the healing of people's hearts that they can get their hearts right with God. Because one day, and I tell you, we're not far from it, there's going to be a call coming, and you're going to stand before the righteous judge, and what is he going to say to you? I take serious, I don't want anyone's blood on my hands. That's why I profess, proclaim, and declare, salvation is of the Lord. You must be born again. And if you're in this church and you're not, you better get born again. Your time is running out. I'm not preaching today to scare you. I'm preaching today because I actually love you. Amen. And you can call me what you want to. Call me a hellfire preacher. I don't care. Let me tell you what. There was a day when I had legs. I could climb pews and run aisles. Right now, that's not quite on the table yet. Amen. But don't count me out. But let me tell you what, it's not me jumping pews and running aisles that makes the difference. It's the blood of Jesus that gets a hold of your life and the power of God that falls on you. And that's what I'm praying. Old time, Holy Ghost, fire sent revival from God that will bring conviction upon hearts and lives and get people right, get people saved, get people delivered, get people in the place that they're good for God. Amen. Hallelujah. A deadly, serious Jesus gives deadly serious warnings so more said about hell than heaven in the Bible do you know that this scripture passage I, I like to listen to gospel music I do quite often 
Uh, we hear all the stuff about people dying. We hear all the stuff about people going to heaven. All that's well and good, and I love all of that. And we hear all the stuff about, you got to be strong, you got to be this, you got to be that. That's great. But you know, I don't hear too, much song, too many songs in the Southern Gospel ranks or in the contemporary or any Gospel ranks that sings anything about the warnings of hell. Think about it. You listen to Gospel Radio this week and keep a running log of how many songs give any warning about the fires of hell. I would dare say if you hear any, I dare say you'll probably hear this many. Zero. We need the preaching of the power of the word of the blood and the deliverance that Jesus will bring in hearts and lives. We need that. Not only do we need the preaching of it, we need the living of it. We've got to rise up and be the people that God has called us to be. So the scripture passage is where Jesus takes off the training wheels and pushes you out and to see how you can run or how you can ride or how you can walk the race that is before you. So the theme says this, following Christ, it's a deadly, serious adventure. Four quick points, and I'll make them as quick as I can. We must pay attention to others, verse 42. Actually, Jesus, you know, we do, pay, we do pay attention to others, but unfortunately, we pay attention to others to try to point out every shortfall and everything in their life that's not right. I tell you, if you learn to pray for them more, maybe you could see a bigger change in their life. Amen. Maybe if you encourage them more, maybe you could be a, be, see a bigger change in their life. Actually, Jesus is talking about those who are weak in their faith. It's what he's talking about here. When I told you, you know, you thought me, oh, he's talking about children. No, he's talking about you that are weak in faith. He's talking about you that are not where you should be with God in your faith walk with him. They do believe in Jesus. I mean, there are weak Christians out there. And you know why you're weak? It's because you won't get in the word. You won't get in church. You won't get on your knees and pray. You won't live for God. You let everything and everybody pull you into the vices of life to live the way they're living. They want to drag you straight into the hell that they're going. They want you drinking, sniffing, snorting, shooting up, shooting down, doing this, doing that, chasing women, chasing men, watching porn, doing everything else. They want you to do the same garbage. Come on, church. But I believe in Jesus. Why are you dabbling in that garbage? Why are you messing with something today that's opposing to the kingdom of God? What does it mean to believe in Christ? The image of God in us has been disfigured. You understand the Bible goes back and it says that, you go back to the book of Genesis, that we are what? Created in what? His image, right? That image has been disfigured by sin which we commit against God. The sins that you commit are against God. We stand under condemnation. But Jesus came to the cross. He condescended and came down to this sinful, hell-deserving earth to die for hell-deserving sinners who were under the condemnation of sin. And he took our wrath and he bore our pain and he nailed it to the cross that we could be forgiven and become God's children. Amen. If you trust Jesus, you can be saved. If you're here today and you've never accepted Christ, do you really want to go to hell? Because that's where you're headed. I don't care what age you are. I don't care how old, young, or whatever. I don't care who you are, where you've been, and what you've done. Jesus saves lost sinners. Jesus is saying there is a price to pay for being a bad influence in a believer's life. If you encourage people, you know, you don't need to go to church. Man, why don't you say, why don't we go there? Why don't we do this? You are not being a, an encourager in that person. You are weakening their faith rather than building them up and strengthening them. Every Sunday, people who go to church and churches that teach 
And we're living in an age where this is being taught. Prosperity gospel, cultural gospel, I could go on and on. Political gospel and all these other false gospels and people sitting underneath that and they walk in empty as a, as a, as a barrel with nothing in it and they walk out the same way. If you're not getting filled up with Jesus, something's wrong. And this causes us to be weak believers to walk in faith. You should be influencing, and encouraging, and strengthening others' lives. And you can only do that by doing that to your own life. Amen. Honestly, I think Jesus is talking about how we treat other people. How we are reflecting Christ to them in our living. He's talking about how we lead or how we influence 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 I had a gazillion posts yesterday from people uh, I'll tell you what I'm still trying to read them all on Facebook I had one lady that we went to church with when we were in San Antonio Texas Sherry and Pete Rogers and great people of God through the years they have continued to serve God and be faithful and win souls I love them both if they're watching this I thank God for you she wrote on the post yesterday that I was her hero. You know, I'm not a hero of, of any caliber. But anything in me that reflects Jesus is all to his glory. Anything in my life that I am and I can do is because he gave me the strength and the power. But I can only do that when I submit myself to him to do that. And the same thing with you. You can be somebody's hero. You really can. You can bring a lost person to church and they get saved. What a hero. Amen. You can encourage someone that's going through a trial and times are tough and they're facing issues or they're sick. You can encourage them and bring them to church and who knows, God can touch them and heal them. What an encourager. That's just some things. We've got to admit our weaknesses. We've got to understand today We've got to do something about our influence for Christ. We need to press people to live for Jesus. No, I'm not talking about getting in front of somebody and trying to cram a Bible down the throat. No, you've got to win their love, their confidence, their friendship many times. But you can be an encourager to win them for Christ. How we treat others reflects on how, oh my, listen to this, how we how we treat others is a reflection on how we treat Jesus. You better remember that. Second, they get quicker here. We must pay attention to ourselves. Verses 43 through 46. Jesus talks about how serious we are about our commitment. I know we don't like to hear this stuff. It's just like, you know, you remember the days of the chalkboards in the classrooms and that's all grease pencil boards and that stuff but you remember the day somebody would take it go in a, I mean it just makes your hair on your neck stand up when you talk about commitment surrender and yielding to God that's kind of the same thing it does to Christians we need to hear it sometimes following Jesus can be painful take my word for it I've been there and done that. Paul said, there's joy in suffering for Jesus. No credit to me, but you know, I could have laid there in defeat and agony and done everything else and why God, why me, why legs, are you kidding? Well, you know, but I thank God that God made me such a profound joy in my heart and such encouragement for my kids and my church, you, my family, that God will enable and give me the strength to get through what I was facing. Yet yeah, I suffer the pain, but oh my God, listen, the testimony that comes out of that, any pain that you're going through right now, you can use it today to the glory of God. Whatever you're in, no, don't run around trying to ask people to feel sorry for you. Because you know what? That's going to run out sooner or later. And they see you coming, they're going to run from you instead of running to you. But if you will let the joy of the Lord be your strength, you can get through what you're facing and you can have a tremendous testimony. I thank God. I had a pastor last week call me and say, I need you to come speak to my people. Well, you know what I'm going to speak? I'll spend a few moments about all the junk that I went through from 
vents down my throat several times and all the other issues and tubes and you name it I had on me and I talked to someone yesterday they said we just didn't think you were going to come through that we just didn't see how you could live through that by the things that Tiff posted on Facebook I'll tell you how I came through it it's a God that's greater than whatever I'm in that will bring me through and give me a testimony that will bring glory honor and praise to his name Paul said Christ abound in us so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ whatever is endangering your discipleship you've got to watch for it because let me tell you what it's just not the physical stuff it's the stuff that's lurking today in the world that wants to destroy your life your testimony and your walk you've got to start dealing with it and purge it Understand today what Jesus is saying about your life. You need to heed. This is not about self-amputation. I just can't help it. I keep pulling it. I'll cut my hand off. You still have another hand. You'll put your lips around it and turn it upside down and suck it out of it if you have to. Let me tell you what, or whatever the other stuff that you might be, I just use as an example. You don't need to go out and do any self-amputation. Please. Your pastor's gone through enough of that and I didn't cut these off. They did. The hospital did. Jesus is saying you should take a drastic step to defeat the sin that you commit because if you're not defeating it, it's defeating you. You must take drastic steps to defeat the sin that has stayed. And let me tell you, as long as you let it stay there, it is going to grow there. And it's going to destroy you and your witness and your testimony for Christ. You know what? You can work and build your testimony, but you know what? Just takes one sorry act of sin to destroy your testimony for God. And you will never achieve or get back to that place. You've got to guard your testimony. Hands, feet, eyes, every part of you. If, if your actions has made it so that you can't follow Christ, then let me tell you something. Don't do those things any longer. Stop it. Don't go there. Don't entertain sin in the world in your life. Don't follow people who will cause you to fall. Did you hear what I said? Stop following people who are going to cause you to fall. Stop fellowshipping and following the world. I'm telling you, don't look on the enticement of the world. And it's there in television, in every place. You can't walk around with your hand over your eyes. It's there, but thanks be unto God. You can submit yourself to God. You can resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Amen. You need to take drastic action. Stay away from sin. Nothing is worth going to hell over, I promise you. Drop friends that are bad influences. What, they're my friends. If they are causing you to slip in your faith, you need to get some new friends. Amen. 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 The sin won't stop until you stop the influences. Got that? Third, we must pay attention to our own pain or our own struggles because we do have them, don't we? Things do happen, but be careful. Don't walk around wanting somebody to feel sorry for you. Jesus said, everything is salted with fire. <sighs> Dog. Listen. There is a purifying effect in persecution and pain. It will purge you. It will cleanse you. Stop trying to find the way out. Ask God, what's the lesson in the pain? Did you hear that? Did you hear that? I'm talking to Cam. There is a lesson in the pain that you're in. There will be fiery trials. Peter said rejoice in suffering. <laughs> Can you do that? This world at present is a fiery trial. But the fiery trial will make you more like Christ. It really will. Following Christ is a serious 
deadly adventure. And last, we must pay attention to our devotion. To have salt in ourselves, as Jesus said, we understand that salt is a preservative, right? We're to have a salt of personal holiness. Uh, we need that distinction. We need to radiate Jesus. We need to show him in our lives every day. We need that salt that makes us different. Do your co-workers or your family or your neighbors, they ever say something like, you know, it's just something different about that person. We've got to have holiness, and if you're going to have holiness, you've got to have another age called humility. Salt is holiness. Salt is devotion. Humility is to live in peace. Amen. This is what grace has done for you. Do you have that purity? Do you have that holiness in Christ? Are you at peace with others? Are you at peace with yourself? And more importantly, are you at peace with God? Are you born again? None of this works without redemption or being birthed into God's family by salvation. Amen.